Welcome, ladies, to the Real Estate Investor Show, providing inspiration, strategies, and insight to empower women investors to live balanced and financially free lives. Now, here are your co-hosts, Liz and Andressa. So in today's episode, ladies, we have Dominique Gunderson. She is in her 20s, lives in LA, and invests in New Orleans. <laughs> we go such a have such a great interview with her. And, and what I think you're going to enjoy the most is she shares a recipe of how to get involved in real estate investing when you're young, don't have the money, you don't know anything, you don't come from a family that has an empire built, and she's able to give a really neat recipe that all of us, regardless of where you are on your journey, what age you are, you can take these, these nuggets and apply to your own life. Absolutely. She started from door knocking right off after, you know, high school and then work for free to gain the knowledge. Those are like all, all choices, conscious choices that she made for a very clear purpose. And then she started her journey in uh, real estate investing that she's going to share with us. Now she's flipping houses at 23 years old. And she really leveraged that because I asked her, how did you deal with other people talking to you about your age? And she said, well, I'm not going to share with you what she said. <laughs> so listen to the episode and, and get to her story. She does not use her age as any excuse to stop her investing in, in real estate. And you shouldn't too. So listen to her episode and enjoy. Welcome back, ladies. This is Liz. And this is Andressa. Welcome back to the Real Estate Invest Her Show, where we are on a mission to empower women to live a financially free and balanced life. Balance doesn't always look perfect. Rarely does it look perfect, quite honestly, but it's important to be who you need to be in all the areas of your life and create financial freedom. And that's really what, what we're all about, right, Andressa? And our, 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 more than our, our community, our movement. Yeah, That's how I refer to what we're doing, is a movement. So we are back with another wonderful guest, uh, Dominique Gunderson. Thank you so much for being on our show. She is from LA and we're going to jump into her story in a moment, but thank you so much for making time to connect with us and connect with our community. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm so excited to share more and just meet you guys and, and join, a, join the investor community. Yes, yes, absolutely. So we always like to do before we jump into Dominique's uh, story and get into her path and journey, as, as we like to say, uh, we'd like to get connected to you and kind of share something that's coming up for us, uh, whether it's in investing, whether it's in, in business, whether it's in our personal life, because there's a lot that's going on there all the time. Something that we feel like will help you in some way. That's why we kind of have a quick little banter at the beginning, not just to hear ourselves talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Andressa, although I do that sometimes, but I try not to do that on our podcast. Andressa, what is coming up for you and what would you like to uh, share share this week? Yeah. So our Facebook uh, group has, uh, we crossed 7,000 members uh, this past week. So we're very proud of the community that we have there where women can really get the support that they need in order to achieve financial freedom. And we have rock stars there that jump in, give support. And this, one of the, the, the posts that I saw the other day that got a lot of comments, somebody getting started, and uh, she asked, uh, where, what should I listen? Uh, what, who, what book should I read? And, and here's the reason why I'm bringing this up, right? Everybody was saying, read this, this, that. Like there was like lists. So like, this is what you should read. And it goes from syndication to wholesaling to raising private money to you name it. All on that list. And then I, I felt compelled to jump in and say, listen, hold on a second. As women, we have this thing where we're, okay, let me read all of it. So I earn the right to be an investor or to start something or to do my first deal. And you don't, you don't need to read all of that, right? Pick something that you feel interested. And if you don't know, pick a book that offers or a podcast that offers what options do I have and focus on getting to understand, like getting to know that specific strategy. 
because if if you get too much at the same time, you're just going to get overwhelmed and paralyzed. Mm. So that leads me to tell you, if you're getting started, we do have a free membership where Liz and I put together on the main content for you to focus on what you need to know first. Do not look at properties without knowing the market, right? So we are very specific of what the steps you need to, to take. So go to our website, the real estate investor.com slash free membership sign up today. But the reason why I'm saying this to you is that if you're not, um, you are impatient like me and you want, you're, you're looking for a mentorship. You're looking for a group and a little bit more accountability tonight. We're closing the doors for our strive membership. And we only going to open in December. We only open the doors twice in a year and we are closing the doors tonight so if you're listening to this podcast now this is your opportunity www.therealestateinvestor.com slash strive you can see everything that we have there all our pod mentors they're going to be leading being our uh, uh leading the pods uh, this this semester are truly amazing and you, you cannot miss this opportunity if you have any questions send us uh, our way address at the real estate investor.com that's it for today <laughs> very cool very cool i love it you know and, and and i was we were just talking in order to be a good mentee in order to have a good mentor you have to be a good mentee you have to listen to people right you know that, that have come before you and then be to your own drummer, but certainly be a good mentee as well. Yes. So love it. Um, Dominique, without further ado, let's get into your story and your journey. Uh, what, what propelled you, Dominique, to get involved in real estate investing, especially when you did, right? In terms of, uh, you know, you know as, as to some people would say, people are young, people are old, and there's different paths of why people get involved and when to get involved, but you did it at a young age. And I think it's pretty remarkable. So what propelled you to get involved in real estate investing? Yeah, I um, I did not really grow up uh, with, you know, my parents aren't in the field. I didn't really grow up with any knowledge of real estate at all. Um, when I was probably like a sophomore in high school, um, my mom started looking to buy a house. This is the first time anyone in my immediate family had ever owned real estate. It was even like that I had even heard the term buying real estate. Um, and I really just got super interested in the process. Um so much about it just sparked my interest. The idea of just dealing with um, a purchase that's so large, something that's probably the largest asset you'll ever own. Um, just dealing with that whole process. And then really the specific property she bought was a short sale. So it wasn't super, you know, updated. Um, and that's where I just started getting more ideas about like flipping houses too, watching different shows and listening to things. And then also like being involved with this process. Um, with my mom and just, you know, the idea of being able to transform something and the financial benefit behind it just really sparked my interest. Um, I was in school at the time in high school, but I was never really too into school. Um, I kind of knew even from an early age, I didn't really want to go to college. I was always an entrepreneur. I wanted to work. I wanted to start my own thing. And so I sort of just stumbled upon this idea of, Hey, as soon as I graduate, let's let's do real estate. Like, let me have this be my thing. And so, um, the the next couple of years of my high school journey just was me, you know, going to school and getting through school, but um, on my own time on the weekends, like seriously, just focusing on learning real estate. And I had it lined up as soon as I graduated. Um, I had a job working for one of the top real estate agents in the area that I lived. Um, I was only 17, so I didn't actually have a license at the time. I wasn't able to get a license yet, but being able to just get in this office, get in this environment at such a young age. And I didn't want to be a real estate agent. I knew that, but I also knew that I needed to learn everything. I needed to learn the contracts. I needed to learn sales, negotiating, all of that. So that was really just like the perfect starting place for me. It's such a young age to be in a very fast paced, um, high energy, very successful environment within the real estate world and just learning so, so much. That's, that's really impressive because 
I don't know, 17 year old uh, folks around uh, where I see unless they are being forced by their parents to, <laughs> to do something. Uh, I don't see many, many 17 year old really like raising our hands and, and having this, this mentality, especially when you were saying that y- this is not something that you saw your family doing. So walk us through your first deal. Like, what was it? Was a, was a wholesale deal or how did you find it? Cause that's what, a lot of people are asking right now, young folks that are getting started to say, okay, can you break it down this step by step? How did you do your first one? Yeah, definitely. So my journey, um, like I said, I knew from a really young age, probably like 15, 16, that my goal was to flip houses, to own investment properties. That was always my goal. At 17, when I started and jumped in, I thought that I should probably just get some general real estate experience first. So I did work for almost two years, um, just learning the ropes in that real estate office as an agent. Um, Like I said, at the beginning, I couldn't even be an agent. So I was just kind of around the office learning and working. Um, But I did sell a house. I live in, in Los Angeles. So it was a really expensive area. It was very difficult for me to be... 17, 18, and talking to these multi-million dollar sellers. Um, but within that time, I managed to sell a property, a very expensive property, which was really just a cool experience. Um, and I guess getting over that hurdle, just like doing that one, knowing I could do it, knowing that I, I knew how to talk to people. I was like, okay, I am ready to jump into investments. That's always what I wanted to do. And so that was when I started looking for the best strategy for me to start with. I didn't have a lot of money because I was I was probably 18 or 19 at that time. So um, I didn't have the experience. Like I said, it wasn't like a family business that I could just jump into. And so wholesaling ultimately made the most sense for me to get started. So that's where I did my first investment deal. It was here in Los Angeles. It was a wholesale deal. Um, This particular one was found with a mailing campaign that went out to the seller Um, and it was so exciting for me, like just the rush of, you know, to putting the whole thing together. It's so funny when you start at, and I, I guess kind of Andressa, like you were saying earlier, um, you don't necessarily have to know everything or try to put all those pieces together because I certainly didn't. And, you know, after you've done deals, you wouldn't necessarily recommend someone who's starting like, Hey, just jump in and don't know anything. But at the end of the day, like, you really can't prepare for the types of deals you're going to get into. Like there's so many things that you're just not going to read in a book. You know, nobody's going to tell you until it comes up. And so that first deal was such an awesome experience of just, it was funny because when you're wholesaling, you're kind of that middle, middle person, you know, acting between the buyer and the seller. So I always felt like I was trying to direct the whole deal. I was telling everybody kind of how things were going to go, what date to do this and that. And I'm the one in the middle with absolutely no idea of anything that I'm telling these people to do, but I'm just kind of walking through the motions and figuring it out as, as it goes. And, um, you know, I'm sure you guys know, but once you kind of get that first deal, you just get hooked and you're more and more excited to do more. So. Exactly. I want to take a quick step back, right? Because you you were, you were giving such a, a great recipe. You worked two years and I'm sure you heard conversations that are not on the books that are for experience on the street, right? What's, what's going on, how to deal with sellers, with buyers that are really challenging or, or even like buyers or sellers that are challenging all that, that you cannot really learn from reading a book. And then you were saying that how much was the, the sale? of the first it was uh like 850,000 850,000 so you were saying to me before I didn't I was 17 or 18 I didn't have a license I didn't have this this or that just I didn't have a lot of things right experience but you closed on a house uh 100,000 uh, 800,000 uh worth what how how and then th- what I'm saying how it's not not challenging you or anything else. What I'm saying is like, it's brilliant that 
you know what you are bringing to the table. You probably your confidence in your building report or whatever you did worked. And I just wanted to go there because I don't want people to listen to this and think, oh, she was lucky because I don't think that that's the case. So for you, what do you think made the seller trust you or and the buyer or whoever you represented trust you? Yeah. Um, so when I was working at that original real estate office, my first couple of years in, I guess I was at a slight advantage because I was so young and it wasn't like I had all these bills to cover or, you know, all this pressure to support a family or something like that. I really was like, Hey, I'm either going to spend, you know, these first couple of years out of high school in college, paying my way through and learning, or I'm going to get out and I'm going to do it firsthand experience, learn, and I'm actually going to get paid to do it. So that was always the clear route for me, but there wasn't a lot of pressure in that regard to like, I had to close one deal every single week, you know, just to support myself. And so, um, it allowed me to take so much time. And I think not everybody has to take this journey, but that was truly what helped me. And I can look back now as it seems so tedious and so difficult during those years without very much, um, without very much to show for, but I can look back now, especially what I'm doing, you know, at this very moment, flipping houses. And I seriously took out of those two years that I originally started, um, every single day I spent the day door knocking houses. Like that is all I did. I spent hours a day walking around. I mean, I had covered blocks and blocks. I'd like, you know, I could walk and be like, I've knocked every single door in this entire neighborhood. And so, um, that's what I did. And it didn't necessarily, like I say, lead to a ton of results. I mean, I probably didn't do a very good job for a while and that's, that's okay. You know, I was learning, I was just getting out there talking to people about real estate um, you know, learning what to say, how to pitch people, how to do sales. And so I definitely had that time where it was so helpful for me to not necessarily be so focused on the results, but just going through the process, learning, you know, repetition, doing it over and over again. Um, and a hundred percent has made me get to where I am now, where seller conversations and negotiations are just like, super easy. I know exactly what to say. I've done it, you know, thousands of times. I love what you're saying on a few different levels. You know, I think often we have this perfectionism syndrome as women. I know I have, I've had it, you know, and I think when you really are in this process of entrepreneurship and investing and doing something that most people you're not doing, you know, you have to let go of that. You know, you just said something really powerful. You said, I was more concerned about the process than the results, right? So you knew that the process was going to get you to the result you wanted eventually. Like that's very powerful because now you know, okay, and I've never talked to anyone that didn't door knock. I did the same thing. Andressa did the same thing. Um, my husband and I also we did it on the weekends was door knock for properties. That's all we did all the time, every weekend, day after every weekend for a year. I mean, really. So it's powerful. We it really is. It is very powerful. And I, and and I think, God, wouldn't it, wouldn't we live more peaceful lives? I don't care what stage of your life you're, you know, the woman listening right now, if we focus more on the process than the results, right? Um, That's just a very powerful way of coming about. And I I love that. Um, The other thing you said that was really powerful too. And and something that I got reminded of, um, of a, of a, because we have a upcoming special uh, interview coming up was that, you know, when you think about all this, the investing advice out there, so much of it starts with sales. Mm-hmm. And if you actually aren't, and, and I read, I think it was Rich Dad, Poor Dad and a few other books. And it said, if you don't know how to sell, that's one-on-one, literally. That's the first thing you should learn how to do. <laughs> I mean, you know, reading a profit and loss statement and understanding cash flow and understanding how numbers work, all important things, especially in investing, right? <laughs> but if you don't know how to sell in the way that works for you, like d- dead end. Right. And I'm like, that's powerful. And then I spent my next 10 years when I was in corporate, that's what I did, you know, in the way that worked for me, right. My yeah. style, right. Cause I'm not going to be somebody who's like hit over the head. So I, I love what you're saying. And I think that's a good lesson for all of us. Again, it doesn't matter what stage of life you're in. 
uh, you're starting out or you're looking to transition the, in your corporate to, 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 to this work is to, um, you don't feel confident in influencing people, start there because that's a great place to start because that's where it all begins. Talking to sellers, talking to buyers, talking to investors, talking to banks, right? So I love that. I just wanted to put, put a pin in that. Um, so walk us through a little bit about, so you're, 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 you're wholesaling, you're gaining confidence. How many wholesale deals did you do before you started to actually then get into flips? Did those two things happen simultaneously? Was that a site, like a, a pivot? Walk us through that a little bit, right? Because we know the risks. I, I, I've done... I've really never really wholesale, but we've done a, a handful of flips on Jess and I flip properties together. Um, the risks are higher, right? The stakes are higher flipping a property. I think it's the highest stakes out of any, 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 any niche of this business to be perfectly frank. It is literally the highest stakes. You can seriously just, you know, drain, drain a project very quickly. Uh, I always say rentals are more forgiving, but anyway, walk us through that transition, right? From wholesaling, you're, you know, we know what wholesaling is to now you're, you're flipping property, right? Different, different risk, risk appetites. So walk us through that transition for you. Yeah. So when I got involved with wholesaling, I kind of always knew that it was like a means to an end. Um, my goal had always been buying fix and flips or rentals. I, you know, I wanted to be the end owner of these properties and I was working here in Los Angeles. Like I mentioned, um, doing this wholesaling stuff, I was always kind of to an extent, yeah, it's your own thing. You're dealing with the buyers, you're dealing with the sellers, but I was working with kind of a little group of people and it wasn't just fully me. I wasn't buying personally the properties, owning, doing all of the, the shot calling, if you, if you will, on these deals. And so that was always my goal, but I didn't have the capital to do it. I knew that I needed the capital. So in the experience, I mean, I wanted to walk through some of these investment deals. So I got this started with wholesaling. I did probably about 50 wholesale deals here in Los Angeles. Um, And at that point, I felt very confident. I had walked through so many different transactions, um, you know, just dealt with a lot of different situations that I felt really confident. I was good enough to analyze my own deals and put that risk under my own name um, and with my own money. So, and I had saved a good amount of capital with all those deals. And so that there was a very specific point. It wasn't like I was buying deals and, Oh, maybe I'll wholesale this one, keep this one Mm. type of thing. It was a very specific time where I said, okay, I am no longer going to be doing this wholesale stuff. I want to buy my own investments. Um, and I actually changed locations to of where I was going to buy. So, um, I started looking in the LA market because that was what I knew. That's where I lived. Um, and it was just too expensive. And I was honestly getting really worn out from working here because it was so competitive too. I mean, every other property literally that came up for sale, somebody had flipped. So everybody was doing it and it was very expensive. And so I started looking for a market that was better for what I needed. Um, I, I don't necessarily know that this is always the best strategy for everybody, but for me, I wanted to start buying just using my own cash. I didn't want to have to get a lender involved or really have any other strings attached because Liz, like you said, when you're starting, you're doing your first one, a flip can be very risky. And I just didn't want to have that hanging over my shoulder that, oh my gosh, if this goes south, I'm going to owe somebody, you know, yeah, thousands and thousands of dollars. So I picked a market that was cheap enough for me to do it with my own cash. And that happened to be New Orleans. Um, And so that's where I ended up getting started. And that's where I do all of my investments today. Um, My dad lives out in New Orleans. So I took a trip out there, saw the city, kind of figured out, is this a good place to invest? And ultimately saw a lot of really good signs for it being a great market to flip in. Um, and I jumped right in, I started making offers and that's, that's where I started doing the flipping. What were those signs? So now you're transitioning, you got the, you got the wholesales down, you, you did 50 of them. So you're like, all right, I got cash. I got experience. I'm ready. And now you now go across, literally across the country, right? <laughs> to the other part of the, on our, our side, the dark side, the East coast. Um, I just, and I love the East coast, but so, and then you transition to a whole new market, right? So, which, which, you know, is so often common right now. People are just like, this is overpriced. I need to look elsewhere. I love that. So what did you, how did you analyze the market in a way that you felt confident enough to flip? What were those indicators for you? 
Yeah. So it was um, a couple of things. One, I really liked the idea that New Orleans was so much less competitive in the investment industry than Los Angeles. Um, I was honestly just getting really burned out. I was working way too much just to get one deal done out here. And so I wanted something that I didn't want to go to a, just another cheaper city that everybody invests in, you know, mm-hmm. um, I wanted to, I wanted to be a little bit different. I mean, I, I didn't want it to be a bad area to invest, but, um, New Orleans is just not a super common one that you hear people investing in. Um, so I really liked that about it. Um, I wanted to start with single family fix and flips. And so there was a great suburb right outside of the city where almost every single home is a single family property. There's not even that many multifamilies in this particular area. So I knew it was a really great area for, for single family flips. Um, there was a lot of properties that needed renovation. Um, there are these certain neighborhoods that you can tell are just kind of revitalizing like now. Um, and so I felt like it was a really good time to jump in because there were a lot of untouched properties. There's a ton of vacant properties um, that, you know, nobody's even, even paying attention to. And so I just felt like there was a lot of opportunity to start touching things that maybe other people haven't. Um, and it's been interesting as I've been in that market and doing it, um, some of these neighborhoods that I'm looking, that I started looking into and noticing those things I'm starting to see the results of it. I'm starting to see, okay, you know, a year ago, every single property that sold in this neighborhood was a fixer upper. Now, every single property that's selling is a remodeled fix and flip. Like people are catching on, you know, they're, these neighborhoods are starting to, to turn around, which is a great thing, obviously. You know, I'm very curious because how old were you when you did your first flip? I was 21. 21. How did you deal with the people, the people around you, your friends, your family, yourself? Was there any like self-sabotage saying, oh, I'm too young or because we we hear it a lot, right? I'm too old. Oh, I'm too far, too close, too young, too not experienced. And I am too experienced. Now I cannot do that. How did you deal with the people around you um, in order for you to really strive and continue building your business? How did you deal with your own mental health? Um, any any self-doubt or any conversation or tough situations with contractors, for example, say, oh, is your mom or daddy coming through or something like nonsense like that happened to you? Yeah, I think this particular market actually was really good for me in that sense in a lot of ways because I still live in Los Angeles. So these are long distance investments. And although I do travel back and forth all the time and check on my projects, you know, when I'm negotiating deals with sellers or talking to real estate agents, most of the time they'll never meet me. And so (laughs) as long as I have a great voice over the phone, I'm confident. I know what I'm talking about. Um, (laughs) it, it works out, but I will say, especially when I was here in Los Angeles and I was even younger and I was in person for every deal, I was meeting people. I ran into so many, uh, situations where I was, you know, out looking at a property, meeting a seller or something. And, totally got that, that vibe from them. Like, um, are you, are you the one I'm meeting? Um, especially being a young female, you know, walking through some of these like construction zones, you know, there, I definitely got that vibe of, you know, are you really the one I'm going to be dealing with here? Do you really know what you're talking about? And what really got me through those moments? Um, I can remember a few distinct conversations where, I just felt so much doubt from the person I was talking about. And I felt like it was going to kill the deal, like just based on looking at me, based on talking, talking to me, you know, things that really shouldn't matter. And so having the knowledge in those conversations definitely helped me through. Um, I remember a specific conversation. I was meeting a seller who was halfway through a, a renovation on a property. So it was completely torn down. I mean, I, looked like someone who shouldn't even be walking through this house, you know, wearing sandals or whatever. Um, and I was super young. I was 19. So, um, I remember kind of walking through it and him just feeling like, 
you know, this conversation wasn't going to go so well just based on the way I looked. And so I started talking to him at the end. I was like, so this is my analysis. I think this is how much the renovation is going to cost. This is what I've ran the comps and this is what I'm seeing the resale value. I just started sharing my knowledge and immediately the, the mood changed. And he, he literally said to me, how did you know that? You know, where did you get these numbers? Because that's exactly the numbers that I have. And, you know, it's just when you show people that you know what you're talking about, um, you have that knowledge and, and experience, you know, you've done deals. It definitely changes the mood, um, even when there's like a prejudgment of who you are. So that's definitely helped me in certain situations. Um, and as far as like confidence in myself, I personally haven't struggled too much with that as far as business goes. Um, I, I am maybe too confident in myself sometimes. I just, I mean, you have to be when you're that young and you're a woman entering into such a male dominated industry of real estate investing, you, you have to have confidence in yourself. You have to not care if people look at you funny or, you know, think that, you can't do it to me, like those types of comments. And yes, I've gotten them many times. They just drive me even further to show them that I'm going to, I'm going to be better than you then, (laughs) you know, and I am going to do it. I'm going to do it better. And so I think you just, you really have to keep telling yourself those things all the time and reminding yourself of your worth, your confidence, and that you can do it. I love that. I love that. Wouldn't that be wonderful if more, you know, 15 to 25 year old women thought that and felt that, right? Uh, talk about the impact of the world as a result of that. It's very cool. Um, so now you're you're doing flips. You started your flipping work in New Orleans, and uh, which is a great city, by the way. Um, my husband and I actually, just fun little fact, we went down in 08 to help rebuild uh, New Orleans right after, um, not Sandy. Katrina? Katrina, thank you. And it was just so so neat. I mean, it, we went on one of the one of the communities outside and to see what happened and then to be part of that was very, very cool. Um, so I, I just I love that area. What so you're doing flips and are you have you transitioned to rentals? Are you are you in that process? Like where are you with that next pivot? Yeah, I'm still trying to figure out exactly what makes the most sense long term in this particular market. I do own one rental property that I bought last year. Um, and I, long-term, my goal is definitely to have rentals. I think I'm still in the process of building up more capital, um, with the flips and like I said, just really figuring out this market. Um, I think there's some opportunity for sure anywhere there's opportunity for rentals, but like I mentioned, especially in some of the suburbs that I'm investing, there's not like a ton of apartment buildings and multifamily. So potentially not those specific types of, you know, deals might not work here. It might be single family rentals or small multifamily rentals, which I still think is a great opportunity. And I am starting to get into it, but I'm still more focused on flipping at this point. Great. And and how important is it to have those focuses, you know, and not get derailed, um, especially now, right? Uh, Because if you're not putting your best foot forward, there's, you know, properties are, are, you're going very quickly. So that's great. Keep focused on your niche, you know, and I think um, you keep moving towards that and it's like, okay, the other things open up versus forcing it. Cause that's what mistakes happen more when we force things. Right. So I love that. Um, and that's what I guess is next for you is, is building a rental portfolio. So that's very, very cool. Um, yes, definitely. The, um, you know, I, I think there's so much that you're sharing that's so helpful here. And I think the women listening, it, there, there's a recipe to, to pivoting and to starting something when you don't know anything, which is what you start, whether you're 17 or whether you're 50, it, you know, there's still, it's a similar process in the sense of like, you know, giving yourself that additional confidence. And, and I love what you said too, just another quick note is that so many people that don't like their jobs want to quit their jobs like yesterday. And then there's then they, and then they just can struggle at first, right? Because they're figuring it out, and it's not like all this money just keeps starts flooding in when you quit your job. I mean, for some people, that's their story. I, I that was not my path. So, and that's not other people's path. So you have to be strategic. What I also loved what you said earlier in in this in this interview. You said I got a job and I soaked it all up in in an industry that 
was so focused on what I wanted to do. And I don't think enough people do that. Getting a job in a property management company, getting a job in a title company, getting a job as as a, as in in a real estate, even not even as a realtor, literally is an, as a, as a um, support to the agents. It's brilliant, and I think people could do that at, at different stages of their lives as well. And I think that's a really, really, really strategic move because then you're getting the experience, and someone's paying you to get that experience. How beautiful is that? So I just I love that you did that too, and I think that's something that doesn't get talked enough about, especially for the people who want to do this actively and and full time. It's a nice segue without having to just let it go and then, well, I'll figure it out, you know, because not everyone can do that, right? They have families, they have a lot of responsibilities. So, um, very very cool, um, Dominique. Where can the ladies listen listening learn more about you and follow along this wonderful journey you're on? Yeah, definitely. Probably the best place is my Instagram page. It's Dom Flips Nola. Um, I try to post a lot of stuff about the projects I'm working on. And as well as, you know, if people want to comment or send me messages, I'm always happy to the best of my ability to try to answer and um, give any sort of help or insight that I can. Awesome. All this information you guys can find on our show notes. And now we're going to transition to our fabulous three question. And the first one is... What is the most transformational book you ever read? I will say, um, maybe not ever, but in the in recent recent months, um, not as a plug to you, Liz, but um, Matt Faircloth's uh, Raising Private Capital book. I think that was a huge one for me that definitely transitioned my business from using just my own capital to do flips into. I read it probably six months ago and maybe five months ago, I started using private money. So I think there is definitely a, um, there's no coincidence there. And uh, just talks a lot about the mindset to get in. And that has definitely transformed my business, being able to go from doing one or two flips at a time to now doing, you know, four to five at a time, um, being able to use other people's funds. So definitely recommend if, you know, you're trying to make that transition. That was a really great book for me. Oh, my husband Matt, is so you can happy send, to be, I know. Yeah, yeah Matt exactly. can send us the check later. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the second question is, uh, what is the most powerful routine that you do to create a financially free and balanced life? I would say, so balance is a huge one. Um, I think it's so important because there's definitely been times where I have not been balanced. I've put way too much focus, time and energy into work and it just drains me and makes me not want to do it anymore. So, um, I would say now I definitely have kind of like a cutoff time, um, every day that I really try to stick to. Um, usually like when my husband gets home, um, the workday is kind of done six or seven o'clock. I really try not to do anything unless it's extremely important for work like in the evenings after those times. And even on the weekends, I try to really just take that time for me to pour into, you know, family, friends, people that I, you know, things, other things in my life that I need to prioritize and focus on. Um, So yeah, really just, I'd say having a cutoff time, cutoff days that you very much prioritize and not get so tied up and focused on, Oh my gosh, I I didn't do enough prospecting today. Let me bleed this into the eight, nine o'clock PM hours. There's always tomorrow. That's, that's been a a really important reminder for me. Awesome. And last question, which woman famous or not has inspired you the most? I'm going to be honest with you guys. This is a really hard question for me. Um, There's definitely been people that I've, you know, worked with or, have inspired me in certain ways, different qualities, but in general, I wouldn't say I've had like, I never had really a a mentor type woman or someone who's been like really close and influential in my life. Um, And there's definitely been moments where I have really wanted that. So um, I would say, I don't know that I have a specific name, but that has definitely, uh, has definitely given me a lot of drive to want to do that or be that for other people, depending on what that looks like. Um, one example, a couple of years ago, I knew I needed to do this and, and start getting involved. So I started leading uh, with my church, a group of middle school girls. I had like 15 to 20 girls and um, mm-hmm. just, you know, things like that, where you can be that person for somebody else that needs that be with them every week, you know, walk through life with them. Um, that was just one example of something where 
there's definitely that that fuel in me to to give to other people I guess what I didn't always have and so sure um I always still need that. I'm still super young. I still need to be the one looking up to people too. And you always are going to have people ahead of you and behind you. But I definitely um, would say that's given me a lot of drive to try to be that to other people. That's awesome. And that's something that we often will say, um, and Jess and I will say, is just that, you know, everyone has something to give and everyone needs something, right? So it's about creating those circles of women that can give and get and support each other. So that's amazing. Keep keep up your great work. Can't wait to hear where your next uh, you know journey is happening. And you have so much to give. Uh, and so just excited for you. And thanks so much for sharing your journey with us and our community here today. Thank you guys so much. It's been awesome. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to receive updates on our next interviews, go to our website, therealestateinvestor.com. There, you can subscribe to our show, become part of our investor community, and get updates on upcoming episodes. If you like our show, please share it with other women who would benefit. And don't forget to leave us a rating on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. And as always, we encourage you to take one action as a result of today's show and put it into motion so you can live both a financially free and balanced life. Thanks for spending time with us. Ciao.